Good evening. It is good to be on this side of the, the building on a Sunday night. I feel like I'm on the, in the wrong place, but uh, it is good, good to be with you tonight to be able to open God's Word. If you'd open up to Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. And let me uh, just go to the Lord again and ask Him for help as we look at His Word. Would you pray with me? God, we come to you uh, as needy people, needing your help to discern spiritual things. We know that uh, we can only understand your word because your spirit enlightens our eyes. So we pray that your spirit would be at work uh, to give us soft hearts, to give us uh, obedient hearts that would be quick to listen, uh, quick to submit under your word, Lord, that we would find encouragement and strength. Lord, we uh, just again lift up the Can family. Just thank you for for their ministry in this church, for Zach and Cass and Bruce and Mary, and just thank you that he finished his race, that he is with you. His faith has become sight. So we just, uh, we praise you, and we pray for, for this sweet family, these friends of ours. Jesus, we, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right, well, we're in Matthew 5. This is a, a little bit of a kind of a, a pullover from the student ministries. We've been going through the Beatitudes, and so just had the opportunity to bring that study, some of the fruit of that study, with you tonight. So we're going to look at uh, all of the Beatitudes, kind of a, an overview of the Beatitudes tonight, uh, really a, a fire hose uh, a little bit that hopefully uh, it's an encouragement to you. And you could title this, uh, this section really The Pursuit of Happiness. If you wanted a title, the happiness, the word beatitude, if you know it means uh, either happy or blessed is how it's translated. You see in your, in your Bible, blessed or happy are a, a certain kind of people. And this, uh, this happiness is not a, a happiness that the world uh, is searching for. And people say they're looking for happiness or they're looking for fulfillment even. You know, I'm looking for a fulfilling job or something that, that makes me happy, that I wake up in the morning excited about or I'm looking for a, a relationship that makes me happy, this person that makes me feel good when I'm with them. This is not that kind of happiness. This isn't a, a trite feeling. This is a, a life, a blessed life. Really, the, the word beatitude is, is actually a life that is blessed by God, a life that has found divine favor. So it's a, a different kind of happiness, an otherworldly happiness, a happiness that comes from uh, living and walking in a way that pleases the Lord. Only, only for those who know Christ, who actually have a right relationship with God through the blood of Christ, can experience this kind of blessed life. Uh, this is what the, the Beatitudes are, a life of blessing. Uh, the one who lives this way is one who has found heaven's favor, that heaven, heaven smiles upon this one. The one who lives like this, these virtues and knowing that they are walking in a way that, that the, the Father, God the Father, smiles favorably upon, like a, a father smiling at his children. I was thinking about just a, a picture of a, of a loving father in the joy of a son, uh, pleasing his father. Uh, my son uh, played soccer uh, a couple years ago, and on his team there was uh, the best player on his team. He's actually, actually related to a couple people in this room, but... He, would, uh, he probably scored eight, eight goals a game. And every time he would score, he would do some kind of cheer. And he would always point at his dad, you know, point at his dad and smile. And, uh, and his dad would just laugh, you know, point back, smile at him. And I just thought of that picture of a, of a son who is, you know, pleasing to his father. who has got, you know, kind of a giddy up in his step after he scores. And his dad's looking on. Dad, did you see that? Yeah, I saw it, son. <laughs> dad, did you see it again? Yeah, I saw it. And this is the, the blessed life, a life that the Father, God the Father, looks at his children, smiling favorably upon them because they're walking in a way that it pleases him. A happy life because it approved by God. So this is what the Beatitudes are. Here is a, a life lived in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. And really, you could call this uh, Discipleship 101. This is for all disciples, all followers of Christ. You know the word disciple is a learner, a follower. Look at Matthew 5, verse 1. You have in this verse the, the first reference to the word disciple in the gospel of Matthew. Uh, a gospel that really gives us a, a call to discipleship. Well, here's the first time we see it. Matthew 5, 1. Jesus saw the crowds, and he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples, 
his followers. They came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them. And what follows the next uh, three chapters, Matthew 5 through 7, this Sermon on the Mount, really is uh, from Jesus, is this is what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. This is what it looks like to, to be a disciple. This is the, really, you could say, a summary. If you want to boil down, what does is, what is Christian living look like? And you look at the Beatitudes, really a, almost like a psalm, a poem that you could memorize. This is the, the characteristics of a Christian. This is what we should go after in the Christian life. Or you could say it this way, this is what the, the Spirit produces in the life of those who love Christ. So here Jesus is putting in front of his disciples, come follow me, and this is what it looks like to be my follower. And here on the context uh, of at the end of Matthew 4, you have large crowds coming to Jesus. He has started his public ministry. He is healing. Look at Matthew 4, uh, verse 24. News about him, that is Jesus, spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains and demoniacs and epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. So you have all, all these different kind of diseases, all these different needs that people have you know, physical needs and fears and and poverty and different things that they can't pull themselves out of. And they come to Jesus and they find help. So you have this large mass of people coming to Jesus. And on the front end, you know, they might be coming to him for all of these real life problems, you know, hard circumstances, a disease, they're poor, they're hurting. They might be looking for a, a new leader. You know, we're under oppression in Rome. Finally, we have a new leader. They might be uh, fearful of pain and suffering and death. So they come to Jesus with all these knees, and, and Jesus here in this sermon, he doesn't put in front of them a, a prosperity gospel. He doesn't put in front of them a, a message of self-help. He actually says, blessed are the poor, the, the mourners, the gentle, all these people that are despised and forsaken. You, if you follow Christ, you're going to be persecuted, he says, in these Beatitudes, so this is not a, a self-help message. This is not a, a personal fulfillment message like the world would have to find a trite happiness. But this is a message for those who want to follow Christ to live in a way that pleases the Lord. A life of divine f- favor, a blessed life, a life of purpose and fulfillment because it's a life going after God's purposes, fulfilled, following after the Lord. And what I love about this passage is God doesn't uh, hide from us what it looks like to have this kind of life. He just lays it out so clear, so simple. And we look at the, the grammar in this passage, it's pretty straightforward. Blessed are this, blessed are this, right? It's pretty straightforward. Here are the, the characteristics. There are, there are eight of them. And I'm just gonna, gonna work through these tonight. I don't, I don't have an outline for you. Uh, and part of the reason for that is just to, just to walk through this passage rather than just listing out uh, eight, eight things, eight characteristics, just for you to kind of hear a summary of all of these, to kind of work through the, the flow here of what Jesus is doing, to put in front of us, this is the, the Christian life. What does it look like to be a follower of Christ? And it's good for us. It's a, I think of it like a, a cleanse, you know, like a health cleanse when you're trying to, you're trying to purge all of the, the bad stuff you've been eating. I want to I do a juice cleanse or something like that. Well, think of this passage that way, that it's actually a cleanse for us. Let's remind ourselves the, the main things. Let's remind ourselves again of what it looks like to follow Christ, what the Spirit is producing in his people so that we can again go after these same things. We can uh, encourage each other toward these things. We can pray for these things. And first, on the front end, the, the entry point, you could say in verse 3, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the, the first blessed, the first indication here of one who follows Christ. What does it look like to follow Christ? Not what the world would think, not the, the rich, not those who have resources, but, but poverty, a certain kind of poverty, not material poverty, but a, a poverty of spirit, a disposition. You could say how you view yourself, that kind of poverty. And just think about uh, what riches get you. What does money get you? Money could buy you a lot of things. It could buy you access. It could buy you comforts. It, makes you, it gives you this illusion of being in control. You know, money lets you into the front of the line at Disneyland, right? You get, you get access. You get privilege. You get, to, you get to, to do things other people can't do. I've heard this joke. Maybe you've heard it. It goes like this, that 
Uh, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy jet skis. And no one ever frowns when they're on jet skis. But, that, but that's what, what money gets us. It gets us fun. It gets us uh, entertainment, excitement. But here, the, the one who, who is part of God's kingdom is the, the poor, spiritually poor, the one who actually brings nothing, who has no resources in their own. And again, not, not financial resources. Uh, you could say spiritual resources. They come to God empty-handed. This is the, the one who is part of God's kingdom. He says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To them belong the kingdom. You could say, to them only belongs the kingdom. Or to say it another way, the, the only people who will be part of Christ's kingdom when he comes, the only people who will be in heaven are those who are poor in spirit, those who, who see their own need, who have come to the end of themselves, who come to God on their knees saying, I offer nothing to you. I don't bring anything to the table. I have no resources in myself. I am I'm broken. I am sinful. I am poor. That is the one that God saves. That is the one who gets to be with Jesus when he comes. That is the one that, that when they die, they go to heaven because they, they see their need for a savior. This is the, the leveling effect of the gospel. And I think about just my own life. The, I grew up in the church and, and knew all the right Bible answers. Could, could answer Bible questions, could tell you uh, what tulips stood for, and, uh, and grew up that way. And then uh, and when I was 22 years old, 22, 25 years old, came to, came to this church uh, and just confronted with, with my own sin. I just remember this period of the Lord just showing me sin and, and the first time in my life uh, actually experiencing this, actually saying, oh Lord, I actually need a savior. Uh, just because I know all the right answers. Uh, just because I grew up in the church. Just because I'm a pretty good kid. Uh, none of that matters. I actually need to be saved from my sin. This is the poor in spirit, those who come to God saying, would you save me? I don't deserve to be saved. I offer nothing to you, God, but would you save me? This is the, you could say, the entry point here. All followers of Christ have come on their knees. This is the, the mindset of those who follow Christ. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I love this quote. I could footnote this whole uh, sermon from uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones has a, just a great uh, sermon series that he preached through uh, Sermon on the Mount just encourage you. There's a lot of different ways that it's packaged, but just such a, a wonderful resource uh, as he works through this sermon. But he says, the, the Sermon on the Mount comes to us and says, there is a mountain that you have to scale, the heights you have to climb. And the first thing you must realize as you look at that mountain, which you are told you must ascend, is that you cannot do it, that you are utterly incapable in and of yourself, and that any attempt to do it in your own strength is proof positive that you have not understood it. I mean, that's what's in view here, that, that this is not something, following Christ is not something that, that you can just conjure up. Producing a spiritual fruit is not something that comes from you. This is, yes, the entry point, and this is true for all our whole Christian life. And what happens so often is we go through the, the Christian life, we look back on on ways that God has grown us, on ways that we've matured even, on victories, and we can start to to actually pat ourselves on the back. And we can start to go, look, look at what I've done. Look at the progress that I have made. And we start to look down on others. I can't believe that they still struggle with that. I can't believe that they wrestle with that thing. I can't believe they're not as far along as me. And we have to come back again to this, this first characteristic, the, the poor in spirit, just leveled by the gospel, looking at, at God and seeing ourselves for who we are, uh, sinners broken before him, and just consider it in your own heart. Just if there are things that you boast about, that you look at yourself and say, God, look at what I have done for you. You know, this family, this church, they really need me because of these things that I bring. And we forget, Ephesians 2.10, that, that all of the good works we do, God has prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Anything good that we have is still from God. Our salvation is from God. Our good works produced by God. And the Sermon on the Mount brings us back here to, to remember the, you could say, the scandalous message of the gospel. You know, the scandalous message that those that are, are sinners and rebels receive grace and mercy from Christ. I think about just the, the thief on the cross. Consider the, the thief on the cross. L look at his life. What did he have to offer to the Lord? What could he look back on 
and say, God, look at what I did for you. I mean, here is a man who was convicted, condemned, guilty, you know, hanging between heaven and earth, hated by his own people. And the thief on the cross, Jesus says, you will be with me today in paradise, not because of anything that he did, simply because he looked to Christ as his savior. I mean, this is the, the gospel message. This is justification by faith. The, the poor in spirit, they're the ones that will be with Christ. The poverty of spirit, the right self-assessment. Now listen to Isaiah 55. Really, this, this call of the gospel right in the middle of Isaiah. It says, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Those who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. I mean, this is the, the call of the gospel, that you have a, a access to God, free, nothing that you bring. And then in, in verse 2 of Isaiah 55, it says, Why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your wages for that which does not satisfy? You have this picture of there's life giving water for you, for those that come to, to God with nothing, just on their knees, broken hearted, open hands, and saying, God, would you save me? And live the rest of their life that way. So this is the, the entry point. You see God rightly. You see yourself rightly. Uh, not, not morose. Not just uh, wallowing in self-pity. But to see yourself as you truly are. Uh, someone recently was, was talking about college. And they were, they were just saying that college is, is just an interesting pl place because everyone pretends to be really happy. Kind of a, a fake environment. Everyone's pretending like life is so great. And so wonderful. And everything is fun and, and awesome and just kind of this contrived experience. And that's, that's the world we're in. That's the social media world, right? Trying to present everything is awesome. My life is great. And not wanting to deal with, with weighty, weighty matters. And you know, even tonight, as, as Chris shared, that this is not real life. That, that, that life has trials, hardships. You know, the social media, how we present ourselves on social media doesn't reflect life as it is. The, the, this life is hard. There is sin and there is suffering and there is death and sorrow. And Jesus here, he's not promising a, an easy life, a carefree life. The one who finds divine favor is not promised uh, an easy life without suffering and hardship. And here in, in verse 4, he says, Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, those who are sorrowful, you know, the ones whose goal is, is comfort, is ease, is just to enjoy life. They will not find comfort. But the one whose goal is to please the Lord, yes, they, they may suffer. They may have a hard life, but they will be comforted. And the, the Christian mourns because they see sin in the world. I mean, you're involved in the life of the church, and you experience tragedy, and you experience loss. And then you look at your own heart, and you mourn over sin. And we are a people who mourn. Again, not, not morose, not self-pitying, not woe is me. You know, there's a, a joy in all of this, but, but a people who mourn, not, not trite. They don't go through life glibly. We actually see the weight of sin in a fallen world, and we mourn over it. We are a broken people. You think about Jesus, the, the Messiah who has promised to come to bind the brokenhearted. Yeah, that's the, the picture here. Those who mourn, the, the brokenhearted. Those who live in a fallen world and who aren't looking for comfort here, but are looking for comfort there, looking for comfort in a different world, looking for, for comfort from Christ himself. You see, the, the Christian has a different goal. Their goal is not to find comfort in this life. Their goal is to honor the Lord and they will find comfort. And you see the, just the radical transformation here. Radical transformation for the believer, the one who follows Christ. How they see themselves, how they see even sin and suffering. And, and really, there's a, a transformation, a, a humbling, like I said, a, a leveling effect of the gospel. The Christians are a humble people. And it's easy for us to use language of humility. We can say, yes, I know the, I know the right answer. I'm a, I'm a lowly sinner. You know, the Sunday school answer. You know, is anyone good? 
You say, how are you doing? I'm doing good. What? No one's good. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? We can say that. We can say, yes, I'm, I'm lowly. I'm sinful. You know, the, the words aren't the issue, but, but you're actually going to see how this plays out. You're going to see how humble you are all of a sudden when you step into the lives of others. And that's where Jesus goes next, uh, verse 5. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. The, the gentle, or the meek, you could say. This is a, a word for humility. And humility as it expresses itself toward others. Again, one thing to, to say, yes, I, I'm really humble. Yes, I'm a sinner that needs a savior. But then how do you respond to others? How do you respond when you're mistreated? How do you view other people? The, the meek person is one who, who is not concerned about their own rights. They're not concerned about what's in it for me. Uh, meekness or, or gentleness here, this word is, is describing strength under pressure is one, one way to translate it. Strength under pressure, like a, a racehorse that's been tamed. A racehorse that has all the strength, that can run fast, but knows how to use that strength in the right way. A running under control. Someone who is, is controlled when wronged, when mistreated. They aren't concerned about their rights. They're concerned about their duties, their responsibilities. Uh, John Bunyan says, He that is down need fear no fall. They are already low, so they're not worried about how other people treat them or mistreat them. So the, the meek one, this isn't one who gets trampled on. You could say, okay, so being meek, being gentle, is just to let other people trample on me. Well, you could say in, in a sense, yes. I mean, Jesus lets other people mistreat him. But at the same time, you watch the life of Jesus, who was called meek, who was called gentle, and he stands up for the truth. Right? He doesn't back down from confrontation when, when he wants to defend the honor of the Lord, when he wants to defend the truth. But, but he's not worried about his himself. He's not worried about his own rights. He's not worried about how he is treated. So a meek person, a gentle person, is not just someone who is quiet. Not just someone who is like, okay, they're in the corner not saying anything. That's good. That means they're gentle. Well, it could be that they just fear man, that they're just scared of confrontation. No, the, the gentle one is the one who is actually able to, to control their strength, to use it at the right times. Uh, one commentator says the, the meek man is the, the one who is always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time. So he is, he is willing to defend those that need defending, but only when it's somebody else, not, not his own rights. And the one who grabs onto their own rights, who says, no, I want it my way. They are not the ones who inherit the earth. You see the, the promise, the gentle, the meek, they shall inherit the earth. It will be given to them. They have a, a title deed to the earth. They will reign with Christ when he comes. Not the ones who are self-grasping, who are saying, what's in it for me? How do I get my place, my seat at the table? But those who actually give up their own rights are the ones who will actually reign and you see here that this would only come from a confidence in the Lord. You would have to be confident in, in the Lord's timing. You'd have to be confident in these promises. You'd have to be confident that, yes, Jesus will return and he will set all things right. I don't need to de defend myself because Christ will defend me. The gospel, it makes us humble. Humble in our actions. Humble in the, the way that we treat others. It makes us a meek people. And not only that, but it changes our desires. It changes our affections, our dispositions. And this is where Jesus goes next in verse 6. You see a desire change, a desire to, to please the Lord. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, or they shall be filled this is God's righteousness, God's righteous standard. You could say that they want God to reign on the earth, his justice, his truth to be vindicated on the earth. They love what God loves. So they want him to reign. They want him to reign in this world. They want him to reign in their own hearts. And I use the word desire because he's saying hunger and thirst. This is uh, what you go after, what you prioritize. You think about just how often you eat. If, if I asked any of you, what did you eat for lunch or for breakfast? You remember what you ate today. This is something you do daily. You hunger and thirst. You eat every day. Uh, you think about it. You don't skip. Uh, my wife does this, this thing every time we go out to eat. As we're driving to the, the meal, she'll say, what are you going to have at dinner? 
I'm like, we're, we're not even there yet. Why, why would I know what I'm going to have at dinner? But she's just, she's planning ahead. I'm just excited to go to dinner. So we, you know, this is things that we desire, what we go after. We, we're not going to skip a meal. We're going to feed ourselves. And here the, the desire isn't about self. How do I make me happy? The desire is righteousness, God's righteousness, God's right standard. Not, not a imputed righteousness. This isn't like the one that's, that's looking for a justification. I think to read this is these are ones who have been justified. This is written to believers. And now they want the, the righteousness of God to, to reign on this earth, to reign in their own lives and their hearts. They want to live righteously to reflect the things that God loves. To, to know that Christ is king. And I want to love what he loves. I want to hate what he hates. I want to hate sin because he hates sin. I desire a world where he reigns. You know, this is how you can pray. Come, Lord Jesus. You know, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A, a desire for Christ to reign in righteousness. So this is an aligning our wills with God's will. And the one who desires God's righteousness, obviously, he, he has to know right and wrong. He has to know what God says. Where we find out about God's righteousness, where we know what God loves is in his word. So you could, you could equal, put an equal sign. The one who desires righteousness, they desire the word of God. They have to know what God loves. They have to know what he values. This is their food. They, they hunger and thirst to know God in his word. Uh, I remember a, a conversation I had a while back with a, a friend who was, I guess you could call a, a social, social justice warrior. Maybe it would be a, a good way to describe him. Uh, and he would just, was always like, okay, you, you Bible first people, you guys that do Bible studies, you sit in the corner at coffee shops, and uh, all you're concerned about is just your, your holy huddle, and you're not concerned about the world. And, uh, you know, and there's, there's a, maybe a, a right concern you could have that, okay, in the church, we could be so self-focused that we actually aren't concerned about others. But, but Jesus doesn't bifurcate. He doesn't split apart a, a holy living from a concern for others. Both of those things are, are true for the Christian. Yes, we pursue holiness. Yes, we love God's word and his people. And we are a merciful people. We are a people that cares about the needs of others, that cares about the, the burdens of others. Verse 7, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The, those that are able to extend mercy, that see suffering around them and show compassion. They have a compassionate heart, a disposition toward those in need. They, they want to step in and help. And more than that, we, we define the word mercy as, as not giving someone what they deserve. Or right, someone who has wronged you. I'm going I'm to extend mercy. I'm not going to give them their due. So this is someone who is not looking to enforce justice, uh, especially when they are wronged. When push comes to shove, that's when our, our character comes out. It's easy to look at this and say all of these, these truths about God, about ourselves. But what about when somebody sins against us, when they mistreat us, when they genuinely mistreat us? You know, that, that's going to reveal our character pretty quick. And we find out that the follower of Christ is one who is able to extend mercy. They quickly extend mercy. They are a merciful people. We forgive quickly because we have been forgiven. And this beatitude is so, so practical, just in home life. Uh, as you have siblings, a conflict that happens, right? Arguments. It's not fair. He did this to me. He took my thing. And just think about what does it look like to be a merciful people? What does it look like to reflect the mercy that you have received from God? And he says that blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. And this isn't to say that, that you earn mercy by showing mercy. And in the same way, Jesus says that, you know, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. It's not that you, you earn forgiveness by forgiving. It's not that you earn mercy by being merciful, but you demonstrate that you have received mercy. You demonstrate that you have been forgiven by the way that you forgive others. You know, someone that has been forgiven by God, infinite offenses against the holy God. That one steps in the lives of others and they, and they forgive quickly. They are able to extend forgiveness because they have experienced forgiveness. This is a merciful people. In here, if you are here and you are unable to extend mercy, I mean, this, you could read this, the Beatitudes here, as a, a test of saving faith, even. 
to say that this is the standard. This is what Jesus says a believer in Jesus Christ looks like. So you could evaluate your own life based on this list and say, do, do, I, do I have these things? Has God produced these things at some measure in me? You know, if I'm unable to extend mercy, if I just hold grudges in my heart at every offense and I'm bitter all the time and I just want a pound of flesh, just to ask yourself, have I received mercy? Have I experienced the, the mercy of God if I can't forgive others? And for the Christian, if your debts have been forgiven, you will be a merciful people. And you can see that these things are impossible in our own strength. These are not things that we can just conjure up. You can't just go through the, the motions. These aren't external things. These are our heart changes. Those who have been born again, who have new desires, a new heart, new loves in their life. And Jesus here in his day confronting the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders over and over again. And they're going after uh, external religion. They're going after, you know, going through the motions, doing all the, the right things by the law externally to, to, to tithe to make sure people see me pray, and to make sure I show up at the, at the events and the feasts, and to check all of those boxes. But they weren't concerned about the, the inner man, where the Lord sees, only where he sees. And here Jesus says, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, those who, who have a, you could say, a clean conscience who live a, a pure life, uh, devoted to Christ. They are concerned about their, their inner man, the heart, what drives them, their affections and their desires. They want truth to reign in their heart, in their thinking, in their imagination, in what they do and what they think about when nobody else sees. Uh, this word purity, you could, could refer to being ceremonially clean. Those that are, are pure, able to worship, temple worship, there, there's a, a, clean, a cleanliness, a purity for those that are able to worship. But, but also this word, a pure in the sense of uh, undivided, a singular in, in affection, pure motives, a genuine desire to serve the Lord, to fight sin, not, not a desire for the things of this world, but a desire to honor Christ. This is the Christian, pure in their desires. Not perfect, obviously. This is not someone without sin. But this is someone with a singular devotion to Christ, uh, pursuing a clean conscience as they see sin. And sometimes it, it takes longer. And God is patient. But as they see sin, they, they forsake it. They pursue a clean conscience. They, they want to, to be able to be undivided in their devotion to the Lord. So this is living before, right before God and men. And the promise here is that they will see God. Uh, this is a motivation here for us. Uh, fellowship with the living God, a nearness to him. The thing about our sin as a Christian, we, we know there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No condemnation. Our sin has been paid for at the cross of Christ. We will not be punished for our sin. But, but as a believer, our sin is a, a break. You could say a break in fellowship with God. It actually, uh, our our. Our fellowship with the living God is hindered. Our love for God, our zeal for him is hindered when we sin. And here, the, the pure in heart, those that, that go after a, a clean conscience, they will see God. They will fellowship with the living God. This is their, their treasure. You say the, the gift of the gospel, more than just forgiven sins, more than just eternity. The gift that we get in the gospel is we get a right relationship with God. I mean, just think about on this earth. I mean, all of you in this room, the, the things that you would value most, that you would treasure most, I'm sure our relationships are people, family members, children, spouses. And here we, we see that the, the believer, they have a, a right relationship with God. They get to fellowship. They get to have a relationship with their creator. And we have that today. We have a, if you know Christ, a, a clean conscience, the ability to, to follow after the Lord, sins forgiven. And again and again here in the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes, goes kind of back and forth from the, you could say, the, the vertical, right relationship with God to the, the horizontal. How does this then play out in the lives of others? Those that, that have a right relationship with God, 
they then have a right relationship with other. They are, they are peacemakers. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Those who make peace uh, proactively, who look at sin and brokenness and strife around them, and they step in and they bring stability to the turmoil and they reconcile more than just trying to live at peace. They're actually proactively making peace. They're willing to, to have hard conversations, willing to pursue other people. I think about Matthew 18, the, if your brother sins, go to him. You know, the one who is a peacemaker is not content to see a brother in sin and, and let it go unchecked. There is a, a love for others, a love for reconciliation, that they're willing to step in. I said a peacemaker, uh, like to think of it not like a, a peace faker. You know, it's easy to fake peace, to pretend you have a conflict, to pretend like everything is okay, make small talk, act like it's not a big deal, and, and never actually reconcile. But Jesus wants more than that from his people. He wants unity. This is what the church must go after. Peace, unity together, working through conflict and difficulty for the sake of peace, because we have peace with God. And this is where he goes. We have peace with God. We should have peace with each other. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You are a family by faith. You know God. You are his children. That means you are a family. You should have peace with each other. So the, the followers of Christ are those who proactively make peace because they have peace with the living God. They make peace with each other. Just to, to recap all, all of these things, you could summarize, I'm just try to think of a, a couple word summary to summarize the Beatitudes so far. I think uh, first, how you view yourself. Verse three, how you view your sin is changed in the gospel. In verse 4, how you view your rights. Verse 5, what you desire is changed in the gospel. This is what believers in Christ desire. They hunger and thirst for righteousness. 5, how you view injustice or even the, the sufferings of others. How you view your own righteousness, uh, an internal righteousness, pure in heart. And then verse 9, how you view conflict, how you deal with conflict, sin in others, you could say. And these are things, again, that God produces, that God produces in you. Not, not something that we conjure up. This is what God wants to produce in his people. And you live like this, this kind of bold faith, living with a clean conscience, a meek, gentle under pressure, but willing to stand up for the truth. You live like this, and you're willing to step into the lives of others. And we find out that you will be at odds with the, the world around you. If you live this way, if you go after these things, you will find yourself at odds with the world. And that's the, the last one, the eighth beatitude here. Jesus says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So they've been persecuted because of their, their righteous life, because of the way they lived. They're not looking for conflict. They're not, they're not going around being disagreeable with people. No, they live a righteous life and they will be persecuted. And look at verse 11, when he says that people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So they are persecuted for living a righteous life. They are persecuted for living for Christ, taking a stand for Jesus Christ. So if you, you live this way, you will find yourself at, at odds with a hostile world. And in verse 12, he says, rejoice and be glad. Rejoice. You, you should have confidence. If this is you and you're living this way and you find yourself being persecuted, rejoice. You know, the world may hate you, but heaven is smiling favorably upon you. He says, your reward is in heaven. And it is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And you think about the prophets specifically here, obviously faithful men, but, but more than just that, the prophets were those who proclaimed the truth. They were those who proclaimed to a, a world around them that there is, a, there is a just judge, that they need to repent. These are ambassadors of the truth. So those that are, that are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, persecuted like the prophets, 
implied here is that we are speaking a, a message, that we are persecuted not because we're, we're sitting in the corner, not because we're, we're going after a perfect little uh, homeschool life, never going out in the world, but because we're actually living in the world. We're actually preaching the gospel. We find ourselves at odds because we are, we are able to speak. We want to speak the, the good news of Jesus. And I was just, I was thinking about just bringing this passage to the, to the, the high schoolers and middle schoolers and such a, a wonderful passage to, to bring to anyone. This isn't, this isn't like mature Christians get here someday. This is, again, this is Christianity 101. This is what God wants to produce in his people. This is what God has produced in you if you know Christ in some measure. He's continuing to produce. But as I was thinking about just putting this in front of young people and, and all of you in this room, that are they're living in a in a hostile world, especially the, the next generation, that if you go after these things, you know, there is a, a little bit of trepidation to put this in front of teenagers and say that if you go after these things in, a, in an increasingly hostile culture, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, where, where might you find yourself? What kind of persecution might you run into? What might the world do to you if you if you live out the Beatitudes? If you are actually this kind of, of salt and light is where Jesus goes next. If you look so different than the world, and you, you think about it, just the, what the Lord would be pleased to do if the, all of us in this room said, no, we're going we're gonna to make this the pursuit of our lives, prayerfully, humbly. We're going to go after, again, with vigor, these things by faith, not in our own strength, to see what the, the Lord might be pleased to do with bold proclaimers of his truth who live so different than the world. And this is a good opportunity for you to also evaluate your own life, to look at these things and say, am I living this way? Do these reflect my life? Am I following Christ in this way? And my hope here is not to, to burden you so that you just, you feel guilt without hope, but to, to have hope that this is what Christ wants to produce in his people. And if there is sin in your life that you need to forsake, that is keeping you from living this way, to forsake those things, confess those things to the Lord. And for, for you who are, who are following, faithfully following, you see a fruit in your life to praise the Lord for these things, to, to again, thank the Lord that he has done this in your life, that he is continuing to do this. That again, we can encourage each other and pray for each other. Husbands, to pray this for your spouse, that they would go after these things, to encourage them toward this. This is a, a life that is blessed. I think about this passage is really as oxygen for the Christian life. To look at it again and just put a new wind in our sails to say, God, this is what you want for us. This is what you promise. This is a promise, you could say. This is what God is going to produce in his people who live by faith. And this is what he, he's going to produce in you if you have followed Christ. So I'm going to, I'm going to close our time in prayer. I actually asked Chris if we could sing just a responsive song after I pray. So don't leave after I pray, but we're, going to, we're just going to respond in song and just worship the Lord as we, we put these truths in front of us. Let's pray. God, thank you for, again, for your word, for its clarity, for uh, just uh, the nature of its power to convict and to exhort, and to encourage, and to admonish. I pray that, that you would do all those things in the, the hearts here, that you would bring admonishment where it is needed. You'd bring encouragement and strength where it's needed. You'd bring boldness. And I pray that you would make us into a beatitude kind of people, a beatitude kind of church, Jesus, that reflects your name in this world, that is salt and light, that looks so different than the world. And it is uh, just a testimony to your saving grace. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen.